last two days, we've had some very interesting and lively discussions. The first day, we talked about at what costs consumption. What are the costs of human consumption and the rates of our consumption? And we talked about the impact of the extractive industries on apes and ape habitats, the impact of industrial agriculture, and disease and zoonoses. And some of the main points that came out is that there has to be much greater and much, much earlier engagement of people focusing on conservation issues, and particularly conservation of vulnerable species like apes, on integrated planning and development. And that conservation has to be much more fully integrated with all the other activities that are happening in the landscape. And we have to really look at the demand and the demand coming from countries investing in ape range states. On day two, we looked at, at whose cost this consumption, who's suffering from the very high levels of consumption that humans have. And we looked at the illegal trade in apes. We looked at tourism, which can also be seen in some cases as a form of consumption. And we looked at the impact of our behavior on apes in captivity. And it highlighted the enormous costs that our consumption has on apes and all of our human activities on apes and their habitats. And it also really highlighted the huge challenges there are in ensuring that apes and their habitats are protected. We need to both stop the supply, which is incredibly difficult, but we also need to address the demand and the demand for the resources as well as the demand for apes and their use. And that includes tourism, where in some cases the apes are looked at as a tourism product or an asset. It also looks at the illegal trade and the trade in live animals as well as bushmeat. And we really spent a lot of time looking at the emphasis on the individual, not just the species, not just the population, but also each individual animal and the suffering that goes, that happens as a consequence of human behavior. Today, we wanna change our focus a little bit and look at some of the strategies and the impact of different strategies on apes. And we're gonna look at apes and the law, extreme conservation, technology and conservation, and then the media and the role of media in conservation. So I'd like to invite the new uh, panel, the first panel, Great Apes and the Law. Thank you, Annette. I'm Katie Carpenter. I think that uh, it's amazing what's occurred here over the last two days. I'm, I'm excited that uh, this kind of conservation summit can occur here in Jackson right before our wildlife film festival. I know it's gonna be good for those of us who are filmmakers. And I think it's good for those of us who are conservationists and perhaps we're all a little bit of both. I am going to uh, give just a bit of, of background on my own role. I, I did produce a film on orangutans in uh, Indonesia and in Sumatra a number of years ago. I was completely stunned by the, the, um, the dearth of laws and law enforcement. It seemed shocking to me, much worse than almost any other species that I had worked on. So I'm very interested to hear today what our panelists have to say. Um, I'm really excited that we have such high powered talent working on this issue. The people that I've met, it's extraordinary. So it's an honor, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists briefly, and then uh, they're going to give you a little introduction into their work, and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A, and then we'll turn it very quickly over to the audience. So let us know if, uh, if you have questions, write them down as you're listening, um, and then we'll engage in discussion afterwards. Okay, first, um, Emma Stokes from the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, she's based in Gabon. She's a primatologist. Uh, she's done field work all over the place, Uganda. Gabon, Indonesia, mostly great apes, also tigers. Um, she's worked on this issue. Uh, now she works on uh, conservation strategies with emphasis on law enforcement effectiveness. So she'll bring to us the international perspective. Um, Anna Frostick works with the Humane Society in the US. Um, she's a staff attorney and she focuses on captive wildlife and animal research issues. 
um, for the Humane Society's Animal Protection Litigation Department. She's led the effort on a number of high-profile exotic pet and animal research issues, and she also drafted the recent petition to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to list all chimpanzees as endangered, and we'll hear a little bit more about that. Sarah uh, Beckler Davis is from the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance, and she brings a unique perspective. She's a primatologist and a lawyer, uh, and she's worked as a chimpanzee caregiver, um, an undercover investigator, a fundraiser, and an advocate. And she currently serves as the executive director of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance. Um, I, think, uh, I think we'll start with Emma, because Emma can give us the, um, <clears throat> the international perspective. And I'll just say, uh, if any filmmakers have wandered into the room uh, for the start of the film festival, I will say that at National Geographic last year, we worked with the Wildlife Conservation Society on our elephants film, and it was an incredible partnership. We really learned a, a tremendous amount from their huge number of scientists working on the ground all over the world, um, and also uh, with their expertise in CITES and in law enforcement. So Emma, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Katie. Um, morning, everyone. Um, so this morning, I just want to, to make a couple of very general points uh, from the perspective of uh, great apes in Africa, uh, wild great apes in Africa. Um, and I wanted to start by saying that uh, great apes are, are fully and legally protected uh, in all rain states across Africa. Um, so this basically means that great apes are classed uh, as protected species by national law, um, which prohibits um, killing and illegal trade uh, of apes in those countries. Now obviously there's a lot of um, variations across range states uh, in both the details, the provisions, uh, and the implementation of those laws, um, but by and large uh, a legal framework is in place. And I think it's probably fair to say that it's not the lack of this legal framework that's the, the principal problem here. So um, what I want to mainly talk about today is in terms of great apes and the law is actually great apes and application of the law. Um, and I want to, to start by giving a general example of a very common scenario uh, from Central Africa, which is where I'm most familiar. So if I could just have uh, the, the first slide, please. Okay, well, anyway, so the example I'm going to give is, is from, uh, from Central Africa. Um, and the next one, please. Uh, from Central Africa. And, um, and next one. Okay. And the area we're really talking about here is the, the combined range of the, the Western Lowland Gorilla uh, and the central subspecies of chimpanzee. So we're talking about Gabon, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Central African Republic, um, and a little bit, of, and Cameroon. Um, next one, please. Okay, so most of this, this grade 8 range um, is forested, as you can see. Uh, and remember this map, because when we're here in 10 years' time after the oil palm explosion, um, you'll be seeing something that looks very different. Um, next one, please. Okay, so about 70% of, of, of this range is in uh, protected areas, as you can see here. Um, but more than 50% of great ape range, and, and probably more than 50% of great apes, uh, actually lie outside of protected areas uh, in logging concessions. And just to give you an example of what this means in, in practical terms, um, so logging concessions um, result in the creation of new infrastructure and access routes that go into to previously quite remote uh, and isolated areas. Um, logging concessions uh, require employees and the creation of, of logging camps. And logging camps invariably turn into to logging towns. And logging towns uh, bring in people, uh, and people need to eat, uh, and people will uh, depend upon the, the resources in the surrounding forests uh, to provide their food. So this then results in, in hunting um, of wildlife, including great apes, in the surrounding forests. And this results in, in an increase uh, in poaching of apes uh, for bushmeat. Um, and I should add, you know, at this stage, in terms of, of the law and application of the law, um, it's incredibly difficult to prosecute uh, the law for, for, for bushmeat and for great apes uh, bushmeat. Um, when it gets to this stage, it's often very difficult to, to identify the species, let alone to to result in a prosecution. So yeah, that's quite an interesting challenge uh, for, law, for law enforcement in this region. Okay, so still with Central Africa. Um, you know, a couple of months ago, we had um, a great ape conservation strategy meeting uh, for this region. Um, and you know, there were the usual disagreements um, across the countries, but there was um, one common theme on which there was sort of unanimous agreement across all the range states 
and across, I think, all, all the, the NGOs and, and conservation community who were present. And that was that poaching uh, of great apes is a primary threat in this region, uh, and that law enforcement is, is the primary strategy uh, on which we should be focusing. Um, and a few days bef before the meeting started, we actually asked all the country representatives from the range um, to prepare a slide. Uh, and on this slide, we asked them to prepare um, uh, a number of metrics which were, were, were hard data, hard results uh, on law enforcement results um, over the last five years in their country on great apes. Okay, and we asked them to present results uh, on the whole range of the enforcement chain, both from detection of ape-related crimes, um, you know, poaching, uh, arrests, uh, and sentencing, due legal process and sentencing, uh, resulting in prosecutions. Um, and when we, when we got the slides back, um, you know, it, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, the data ranged from sort of non-existence to extremely scant. You know, there's, there's very little information uh, on any of these aspects in terms of, of application of the law and law enforcement. Um, so, you know, the last, the last point I, I want to just quickly make is, is one of accountability. Um, I think, um, you know, if laws are going to be effective in, in protecting apes in this region, um, then we really start, need to start evaluating them on the basis of, of hard results. Uh, and that's results on detecting crime, results on arrests, and the results on the proportion of those arrests uh, that lead to successful prosecutions. And that goes for ape trafficking, that goes for patrolling and protection in protected areas, and that goes for patrolling and protection uh, in logging concessions. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a few good examples of this uh, for anyone who was present uh, at the sessions we had yesterday. I think Laga and the Eagle Network are doing a very good job in promoting this agenda, essentially starting to work from a blank canvas on this throughout the region. Um, we were also discussing a few days ago with colleagues um, the situation, a kind of milestone situation in Sumatra about a year ago, uh, which was the first successful prosecution of an orangutan trader, and that in itself is a bit of a remarkable statistic, the first ever prosecution of, a, of an orangutan crime. So I think, um, you know, we really start to, to, to need to put a focus uh, on accountability here. Um, you know, I think with all the, the momentum now for elephants, for example, we're now starting to demand, to demand this of of conservation efforts and enforcement agencies for elephants. Um, and given that in many of these range states, great apes um, share exactly the same legal status as elephants in many of these countries, uh, I think there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't be demanding the same kind of scrutiny uh, for great apes in terms of uh, law enforcement and application of the law. Wow, thank you so much, Emma. What incredible work you're doing. And that's a remarkable story about the first ever prosecution in Sumatra of an orangutan trader. Even more remarkable for me because when my film crew got to Medan, our story started in the backyard of a police official who had orangutans chained up in the backyard. So uh, that's a long way to come in three years. I think that's fantastic. Um, but there's a long way to go. So Anna, if we could uh, pass it over to you then. Thank you. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so in addition to the foreign laws that Emma spoke about, you know, we talked yesterday about how CITES obviously applies to all of the great ape species, and CITES is implemented domestically through national law. And in the U.S., that law is the Endangered Species Act. Um, all apes in the wild are protected under the Endangered Species Act, which means that import permits for either live animals or biological samples are required to enhance the survival of the species in the wild. There's a permitting structure in place, which I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with. Um, and because that enhancement standard actually means that there has to be a positive impact on the species, the Endangered Species Act creates an extra layer of protection over CITES um, in addition to the non-detriment finding, which is just kind of a no net loss or gain um, on the species. So, However, captive chimpanzees in this country have never had protection under the Endangered Species Act, despite the fact that their wild counterparts have been listed under the statute since 1976. Um, so in 1976, the entire species was listed as threatened. Um, when you have a species listed as threatened as opposed to endangered, the Fish and Wildlife Service is allowed to essentially pick and choose what protections will apply to that species, what are needed in order to promote the conservation of that species. And in 1976, 
Congress, um, the agency set up what's called a special rule that said that absolutely no protections would apply to captive chimpanzees in the U.S., and it's very clear that that law was put in place specifically to facilitate biomedical research on a species. Um, in 1989, there was a petition to the Fish and Wildlife Service, which we heard a little bit about last night in uh, Jane Goodall's keynote speech. Um, JGI and the Humane Society and World Wildlife Fund uh, co-petitioned to uplist the species to endangered. Um, and as we heard last night, unfortunately, the result of that effort was an uplisting only in the wild population and a ma maintenance of the status quo of threatened for captive chimpanzees um, of anywhere they are found and a special rule s continuing to say that captive chimpanzees in the U.S. would not be um, receiving any protection under the law. And so that is what has been referred to as, quote, split listing, um, this differential listing between the captive and the wild populations. Um, and what that means is that the Endangered Species Act protections that pro apply to species within the territorial um, jurisdiction of the United States, which are called take and interstate commerce, um, don't apply to captive chimps in the U.S. And the take prohibition is uh, that term under the statute means anything that actually harms or kills the species or something that harasses the species. And harassment is defined as a significantly, uh, anything that significantly disrupts normal behavioral patterns. Um, so split listing in the U.S. has allowed for completely unregulated use of captive chimpanzees um, for the pet and entertainment trade and invasive biomedical research. So in 2010, we petitioned again, and by we, I mean the Humane Society and our international partner, Humane Society International, partnered again with the Jane Goodall Institute, Wildlife Conservation Fund, PASA, um, the Fund for Animals, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, um, and the New England Anti-Vivisection Society. And I really consider this petition to be the nexus of conservation and welfare. We talked last night about how each individual matters, and you know I think that that, that phrase applies to both humans and animals. Um, so since the U.S. is not a range state, as we've been talking over the last few days, I really think that this effort is a way for the U.S. to have an impact on the conservation of these species which aren't within, directly within their territory in the wild. Um, so we've relied a lot in this context on uh, several studies that were published both by Steve Ross and Brian Hare um, that some of you in this room might be familiar with that suggest that uh, media depictions of chimpanzees and not the type of documentary films that we have um, seen you know in this context and elsewhere but you know the commercials that we heard about yesterday dressing chimps up in a suit for Super Bowl ads the like um, really have negative conservation impacts because they lead viewers to think that the species is not endangered in the wild. Um, because those uh, depictions primarily feature juvenile chimps, it really misleads people as to the simple biology of the species so that people don't understand that they do grow up to be big and powerful. Um, it also, through Brian Hare's study, he has shown that it decreases the likelihood that people will donate to conservation efforts when they're desensitized with those images. And it also increases the demand for people to keep them as pets when they see individuals interacting with them in such a you know, what appears to be a safe way. It increases the demand to keep them as pets. Um, so we had this petition submitted um, in 2010, and the ESA listing process is a multi-year process. So we first get a 90-day finding, which we got in September of 2011. That's the first kind of threshold that you have to pass where the agency says that they think that the petitioned action may be warranted and they open up a broader review. Um, and they completed their status review and issued a 12-month finding and a proposed regulation in June of this year to eliminate the split listing. Um, and we're still waiting on that rule to be finalized. Uh, we are very hopeful that it will be finalized in the near future. And the goal of changing that listing is to ensure that the ESA permitting scheme applies to captive chimpanzees in the United States. So again, it, um, activities that are deemed to either take the animals or interstate commerce issues would have to would, could only um, occur pursuant to a permit. Um, and these permit applications are published in our federal register. They're um, publicly available. There's an opportunity for members of the public to comment on these applications to help the agency grapple with their conservation value. And again, you know, the whole purpose is to require the applicant to show 
that what their activity would do would enhance the survival of the species in the wild. Um, there's also a statutory provision that allows permits for scientific purposes, um, but it's clear from the statutory scheme that those scientific purposes have to be for conservation science, not um, for, for example, human health science. So we anticipate that if this is finalized and the permitting scheme is applied to captive chimpanzees in the U.S., it will sig significantly curtail the pet and entertainment trade. Um, for example, there won't be an opportunity, hopefully, for somebody in Missouri who's breeding chimpanzees to sell a pet to somebody in South Carolina. Um, we would argue that that type of interstate sale has absolutely no conservation benefit and, in fact, undermines conservation and therefore shouldn't be allowed. Um, Similarly, the treatment of chimpanzees in some of these captive situations, uh, we would argue that there are numerous takes involved along the spectrum of their lives. And most importantly, I think, is the premature mother-infant separation. We've heard um, a lot throughout the last few days about this common practice in um, some of these substandard exhibition facilities of pulling chimpanzees directly from their moms within days or weeks after birth. And again, there's no doubt, um, probably with anybody in this room, that that would significantly disrupt the normal behavioral patterns of the species. Similarly, invasive research that actually harms the animal would also be considered a take and therefore would be subject to the permitting scheme. Um, so the real question that we're grappling with, and I'm happy to uh, talk about this further, is really how to demonstrate enhancement when you're talking about captive individuals. And there's no doubt that the agency would agree that legitimate captive propagation, for example, the only example in this country is that which is occurring pursuant to the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Species Survival Plan, um, a science-based program that is geared specifically towards promoting um, and preserving genetic integrity limited numbers of birth, respecting the species um, normal interbirth interval, and that's one way to demonstrate enhancement. Um, we do have a concern, which I think is a, would be an interesting point of discussion today, which is that the agency has started wading into an interesting ethical uh, area, which is what we're calling pay to play. And what is happening with other species, this is not just a problem for chimpanzees or apes or um, you know, any taxa, is that the agency has in certain circumstances said that essentially no matter what you're doing with an animal in captivity, including killing it for a trophy hunting purpose, um, that is, constitutes conservation if you're offsetting that activity with a donation to an in situ conservation project. And we have a lot of concern um, about the legality of that whole program and also you know, the efficacy of whether or not that is actually con conservation. Um, and so you know, I think that especially since there are no guidelines on those um, types of donations, it's just kind of a free for all at this point. That's the one concern that we have going forward if the permitting system is to apply. And, and I think that I would just leave a question here for um, so many of our in situ experts, you know, would in situ projects even um, accept donations from these types of activities. You know, you're talking, for example, um, an invasive biomedical research protocol for hepatitis C virus. Um, and, you know, would a program anywhere in Africa be willing to accept a donation from a laboratory just so they could continue um, their activities? And I would hope the answer um, would be not likely, but I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on that. So, thank you. Wow, thank you, Anna. What an interesting presentation. And you remind me that there's there will be questions, I assume, from the audience um, along the lines of what can we do. And uh, in this audience, we're mostly professionals. Um, when you mentioned the Brian Hare report, it reminds me that there's more that television and filmmakers, media makers can do. Um, but there's also ways we might be able to, you know, bang on the door of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, too. So it would be interesting to talk about that afterwards. And you mentioned pay to play. You know, we had a discussion here about that two years ago. We called it the calculus of conservation. And it's used in so many countries now, in Tanzania specifically, regarding elephants. How much is it worth dead? How much is it worth alive? And if you don't include the ethical piece, that cost-benefit analysis is never going to work out in our favor. So that's, that's worth talking about, too. In any case, Sarah, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Um, and you can put that first slide up, please. Um, 
So I'm just going to throw out a little more food for thought that kind of follows up on both of these two experts here. Um, we work in, the, in North America, in the U.S. and Canada with um, captive chimpanzees. So I have a couple just photos um, that I'll show you of things that are legal. And um, the question, sort of overarching question for this panel was, is the law, sort of that law with the capital L, um, sufficient to protect great apes? And um, I'll just take the easy question there and say no, um, it's not. And um, I think um, those examples uh, that you've heard already make that really clear. Sometimes there's a framework and it's not working well or not being enforced well. Sometimes there's no framework at all. So in the US, um, we have a lot of hopes for the ESA change that we expect to be coming. It'll make it a whole lot more difficult to do a lot of these things, but it doesn't necessarily outright ban any of these things we're talking about. Um, it makes it a lot harder and hopefully will, as Anna said, curtail a lot of these things. But um, lawmaking is collaborative or it's supposed to be and um, it involves exceptions and exemptions and loopholes and there's always something, right? So. Um, is it sufficient? No. Is it one of the tools in our tool belt that we can use? Absolutely. So um, if you can just go to that first slide, I'll just show you a couple of photos of situations that are completely legal uh, as of right now in the U.S. Not illegal, but legal, allowable. Um, and as a side note, as a lawyer, I'll say that I'll look at every one of them in my head and say, no, but that might be illegal and that might be illegal and this is what we can argue about. But overall, the broad view is this is okay. So this is um, a, a chimpanzee um, in a breeding facility in Missouri. He's in a basement. He's in that tiny little cage there held by chain link, which is, um, for those of you who take care of chimps, probably not likely to hold him in there for his entire life also um, completely legal. The sale of his progeny would um, become a whole lot harder or potentially banned across state lines if the ESA um, final rule becomes finalized, but within the state, um, you can't reach it um, as well. Go ahead. Another situation that was viewed as completely illegal, these are two um, very young chimpanzees being kept as pets in someone's living room. That's their, that was their world at that point when they became too strong um, to be controlled and taken to Dairy Queen or whatever else the pet owner was doing with them. Thankfully, these two are now at a sanctuary because um, this situation got um, unwieldy. Another legal situation, so um, the use of chimpanzees in circuses. Thankfully, it's a dying trade, and I think that's um, a lot to do with just the public distaste for it um, and also the public safety risks, but um, still happening. Still um, one or two chimpanzee acts that are um, touring the U.S. and doing, dressing up like this. Um, for those of you who know chimpanzees, you can see that this is a fully adult chimpanzee, not one of those cute, cuddly babies we see on TV. Go ahead. This was also a legal situation. Um, these were chimpanzees being kept on a training compound in LA for the entertainment industry. That was their, um, their enclosure. That's what they lived in. Um, thankfully, now they are also in one of our NAPSA sanctuaries um, post-rescue. Um, that, that rescue and the other rescue I mentioned um, involved lawyers, for sure, but didn't necessarily come about because what these people were doing was illegal. Go ahead. And um, I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about um, research. It's getting a lot of play in the media. It's been in the New York Times a couple times recently. Um, the U.S. government is looking at significantly reducing um, the use of chimpanzees in invasive biomedical research. This is legal um, and uh, will continue to be to some extent even with the pending changes. This um, is a chimpanzee friend of mine named Negra. You can see her cage and that was where she lived and those conditions are allowable by law. Go ahead. So now that I've depressed you with those lovely photos, um, I'll provide a little inspiration. Why do we keep pushing? Why do we use these legal tools when they're available? Why do we need more legal tools at our disposal? Um, why do we need every possible tool we can think of in our tool belt to protect these amazing beings who captured my heart long ago and I'm sure um, everyone here as well. So go ahead. So this is why we keep pushing. This is Jamie. She is also a chimpanzee friend of mine. Um, this was her on day one after a lifetime in um, research and also um, 
as a pet and in the entertainment industry. So this is Jamie, day one, go ahead. And Jamie, after being rescued in a sanctuary, she, um, you can see just visually, there's a lot of change there, go ahead. And this is her life today. This is Jody on day one after, again, 30 years in research, a whole lot of um, babies who she produced to go into the research industry. Um, and Anna mentioned the premature mother-infant separation. You can see in knowing her that that really affected her. She had nine babies taken away from her when she was used in research. But this is her in sanctuary. And again, go ahead. And there she is today. Go ahead. And finally, this is Negra, who you saw in that cage earlier. That was her. You can see she looks like a zombie. This was after 30 plus years of being subjected to fully legal research. And there she is in sanctuary. And this next one is my favorite picture. Go ahead. <laughs> She's enjoying the sun as she should. So um, just a little inspiration there so that I don't leave you with the dark, depressing photos um, of what we can do with these legal tools and otherwise to protect them. Wow, that's a very powerful presentation, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to know where to begin. I think what's in common, um, the three of you have, uh, have worked tirelessly to try to overcome legal obstacles. And the thing that I'm not sure I quite understand is, where is the bigger obstacle? Is it in the making of the laws and the listing of the species, or is it in the enforcement of those laws and the prosecutions? And, or, or is it ridiculous to even try to discern? And I'm asking because I want to know, is, is there a way to identify where's the first place to push even harder? If you had more resources, what would you do? Emma? Sure. I mean, the, the laws aren't, I'm talking from the wild, apes in the wild perspective. I mean, the laws aren't perfect, but the laws are there. Apes are legally protected, and in most countries are afforded you know, they're on class one of protected species in most countries. So, um, you know, and any contravention of, of those laws is, is typically prosecuted under the Wildlife Act in those countries. So, uh, you know, in many places, Congo, Gabon, for example, apes are uh, given the same legal status as elephants, for example. So, you know, the laws are there. So it's A lot really of good that does. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and they've worked really well. Yeah. Um, so, but the laws are there. Um, but to, to be any effective deterrent, you know, they have, to, they have to be enforced. People have to believe that they're going to get caught or that opportunity costs are such uh, that it's just not worth it. So, you know, I think, and it, and it, you know, it takes a lot of effort and it takes to, to put into to making sure that those laws are applied. Now, first you need to like detect the crime, then you need to make sure the right people are arrested, then you need to make sure that a case can be built, so you need legal support, then that case has to go to court, so you have to make sure the judiciary uh, are playing ball on that issue, then you have to make sure that the person stays in prison. I mean, these are, you know, this requires a lot of time and effort, but it, but it can be done. You know, the work of, of folks like uh, Lager and Palfer has shown that this can be done. Um, so it just requires a, an awful lot of, of, of effort and investment. Um, and then just the one other thing, in terms of the laws themselves, I mean, there's, there's, there's room for improvement. Um, so we've talked a little bit about penalties. Um, they're, they're highly variable across countries. So, for example, the highest penalty you can get, uh, I think in Congo, it's up to five years. Uh, in Gabon, it's up to six months. Uh, and Gabon is now changing the law largely around the elephant situation to, to increase that penalty, and, and that will benefit apes as, as well. Um, there's also a move for elephants, for example, to get um, ivory poaching listed as a serious crime. So it then starts getting prosecuted, not under the Wildlife Act, but under the same acts that are used for, for drugs and, and, and other human-related human crimes. Um, so I'd, I can't see that happening for apes anytime soon, but it, will, it is sort of an option, of a legal tool available to you, for example. Let me just follow up on one thing. When we were uh, researching the last film, the elephant film, we interviewed Roger Fatso in, in Cameroon, I believe. And, uh, and he sent us a video of the bushmeat markets where he was working that were astonishing and completely wide out in the open. So um, in addition to having more people involved in law enforcement, does there need to be a change in, in public opinion over there? I mean, how could... What else could you do to, to start to change, I don't know, the culture? And maybe we can't as Americans, but maybe we could with local partners. What do you think? I mean, I mean bushmeat is so, certainly in Central Africa, it's so ingrained uh, in everything. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to stop bushmeat being an issue. Bushmeat for great apes, you obviously have to, to, to work to stop, to stop that. Um, and I think, you know, that can work to some extent. 
Um, I think there's always going to be an underlying uh, demand for grade 8 bushmeat in, in, in urban centres. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't take very much to have quite a significant ecological impact on, on grade 8 populations. Yeah. Um, but I think education awareness campaigns on that in large urban, urban markets are, are certainly worth the effort, yeah, yeah. for sure. But it's um, a tricky one, push me. Anna. Yeah, can I just add on the enforcement issue? I mean, one of the things that attracted us to pursuing this Endangered Species Act petition uh, domestically is that one feature under U.S. law that is somewhat unique, um, and it's not under all U.S. laws, but under the Endangered Species Act and some of our other major environmental laws, is that there's an opportunity not only for the government to enforce these laws, but for private citizens to enforce them. And so the Endangered Species Act has something that's called a citizen suit provision that allows any individual who is an interested party to sue somebody for violating the Endangered Species Act. So this would open up a whole range of enforcement activities, even outside of what the Fish and Wildlife Service would be willing to pursue. And you would be talking private NGOs directly filing a lawsuit against a laboratory or against a pet owner or against an entertainment venture. Um, and I think that that tool for enforcement is really unique for the United States and potentially hugely helpful in this context. That's incredible. I don't know if, uh, if that's widely known. Maybe we all should do that more. I consult on a project for the Yale Law School. Maybe we should uh, pepper that into the curriculum in some way. Um, Sarah, what would you think about all this? I, you know, I think it's a really, it's a holistic effort that's required. And I, I don't think there's a do this first and then this second and then this first way to un unravel it all. It's just this big mess. And we have a lot of passion and a lot of um, support for these issues. And I think everything that everyone is doing, you know, working on the range state issues, working on enforcement where there is a law, working on figuring out how to create new laws, Lawsuits are, can be very um, compelling, um, also very expensive. But um, you know, I think it's um, and you know, public public opinion really matters too. And getting the issues in front of more public has been really powerful for the issues that um, we're working on in the U.S. for captive chimps. I think um, the fact that a senator got involved at one point a couple years ago made a huge difference. And that senator got involved because their members were reading about these things in the news and talking to him. And he, you know, when a senator says, you need to look into this, the NIH or whatever the agency, they have to do it, they do it. So it's this um, just snowball that's building from every possible angle. And I don't think just one way is gonna do it. I think you know all of these sort of chipping away efforts are what's making the difference. And just uh, to add, add on to that, you know, there is this whole mess as Sarah refers to, but there's also a lot of angles. And one angle that we haven't referenced yet, which I'll just put out on the table, is that, you know, I spoke about federal laws, but state laws and local laws are relevant here. Um, you, it's within the capacity of every single state in this country to completely ban both private possession, research, et cetera. Those are activities that are wholly intrastate activities for the most part that the federal government does not have the jurisdiction to regulate. Um, but it's that patchwork that we have here in the U.S. with our federal system um, that, you know, we need both. We need the state laws to improve and the federal law to improve. Um, <clears throat> here's a question. Do you believe that uh, great apes should have uh, ape-specific laws and not fall under general wildlife laws, especially internationally? Um, and I suppose to some degree they do. Um, but do they, should they be strengthened because of the relationship of great apes to us? Should they get special treatment in any way? Do you believe that would be possible? And do you believe it would be worth attempting? Emma? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, I can't, I can't think of any example. I mean, maybe someone knows of one in the audience, but I can't think of any example where there are great apes specific. Well, like the CITES, you know, Appendix 1, you know, it's slightly specific. Sure. I mean, yeah, I guess, they're, I mean, they're listed on Appendix Appendix 1, for sure. Um, yeah. Should there, should there be an Appendix 0 for apes? I mean, I don't know. I mean, one part of me thinks that, um, by you know, I don't know if, are you necessarily doing uh, apes any favors by singling them out on international law? Because you want to just try and get the appreciation that it's a crime to do this. You know, it's not like a kind of not so important crime because it's wildlife. It, it's a crime in the way that other things are a crime. So I don't, you know, one part of me thinks that maybe it's not a good idea to, sing, to single them out in that way. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not wholly convinced uh, from the international perspective that, 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 that that's the way to go. I mean, you know, um, 
yeah, not wholly convinced. Yeah. yeah. Anna or Sarah, any thoughts? I think that it's it's unnecessary. I don't think that it would be a huge benefit on top of what we already have um, in the Endangered Species Act. You know, that applies to thousands of species and the penalties are relatively strict and the structure is already there and well established. Um, similarly, under the state laws that I was referencing, great apes are often not treated separately. They're treated alongside other what we call dangerous wild animals. These are your state laws that prohibit people from having tigers in their backyards, etc. And so I don't think that if you're going to go through the, all the effort to go through the legislative process that all you want is that one chip. You want to bring along as many species that are suffering from these same issues as possible. And so I don't think that we need to have a specific legislation, at least domestically. There has been an effort in the U.S. to, to create that, you know, great ape specific um, protection um, with a law that would have um, or would ban um, invasive research just on great apes. And um, it's sort of um, on hold pending all of the regulatory and other efforts that are going on that are probably uh, more likely to succeed. Um, but, you know, I, I agree that it probably doesn't make sense to single them out, but I think sometimes great apes are a foot in the door um, where, you know, if you said um, protect all captive animals, you would get ha ha no. But if you engage in a discussion about how similar chimpanzees are, for example, to us and people relate to them and, you know, you, they, they, chimpanzees experience the world in the same way that we do, basically. And so when you have that conversation with people, it's sort of the opportunity not to sell out all the other species who also need protection, but to just sort of plant that seed. And, um, you know, for whatever that's worth, they sometimes end up being that kind of flagship species that where you can have those conversations, you know, and, and of course you're also thinking about the elephants or the monkeys or whoever else. I, you know, just from my perspective as a, uh, as a filmmaker, um, this notion of extreme conservation is very interesting and, and confusing to us. How far would a country go to save a species? Togo was in the news last month. One of the kingpins for ivory poaching was, uh, elephant poaching in the ivory trade was arrested in Loma in Togo. And, uh, and, the, and the word came out and there was a lot of confusion in how many elephants are there in Togo. Anybody know there's 60 elephants left in Togo, they believe an estimated number. Um, <clears throat> so to have the people that we were hearing from in, in Lome were saying, let it go. It, we're done with elephants, let's move on. And um, I wonder, you know, how, how far, can you think of examples of countries that have gone way beyond, above and beyond the call of duty to protect their great apes and, and whether they have strategies that could be could be spread, could be scaled up and shared with other countries. Yeah, I mean, it, <laughs> I guess it's a, a, a pretty sad state of affairs when the countries are singled out for actually, you know, enforcing the law that exists already. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there are a few examples, but there's not very many examples. I mean, you know, I live in Gabon, and Gabon's a, an unusual country in the Congo Basin in that it is going to quite extreme lengths um, to protect uh, some of its wildlife. Um, not necessarily um, focusing on apes, but more focusing on, on, on elephants with the burning of stockpiles and uh, changing its legal uh, framework for, for elephants, for example. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I, thi <laughs> I think when we're highlighting countries as doing a great job because they're enforcing the law, which is basically what we're talking about here, and that's a, you know, I mean, obviously we have to promote those countries uh, and try and instill that sense of, sort of leadership and setting the benchmark high, um, but that's really what we're talking about here, enforcing those laws that exist in a rigorous and a very transparent and accountable way, I think. Um, like another thing with Gabon that, um, that, I, that I think is a really good idea is, um, you know, they publish their, um, the National Parks Agency, you know, publishes their, the level of their enforcement efforts on the web now, on their website. Um, so you can go on their website and you can see how much patrolling or how little patrolling um, they're actually doing. Um, now, you know, it, it's not perfect. I'm not saying they're saints by any stretch of the imagination. But these are the sorts of steps um, that we'd be looking to, to, to try and promote, this kind of accountability. Great. You know, I'll just add that Kenya just launched a couple of weeks ago a website yeah. called Poachers Beware, yeah, which is... Um, it's uh, listing the names of people who've been arrested for poaching because in Kenya they're always released about two days later. So uh, the names are up there now in, a, in an effort to shame them in their communities. We'll see how that works. Anna? Yeah, I would just add on this issue of um, certain jurisdictions having strong laws that 
become an example for others. I mean, we've certainly used international and foreign laws in our efforts to advocate for stronger federal laws here um, you know, on all of these issues. We've pointed out, for example, in the Endangered Species Act petition that apes are protected, chimps in specific, are protected under all of the range state laws, and that it's, you know, as, we, as was discussed yesterday, it's hypocritical of the U.S. to be sending conservationists over to Africa, you know, demanding increased protections and increased enforcement when we are not doing the same here. Um, similarly, with invasive biomedical research, the U.S. is the only country that is still pursuing that. Um, with chimpanzees, and we've definitely used that issue to pressure NIH to um, get in line with the rest of the world on this issue. Sarah. So the, um, the range state issues are sort of almost the flip side of the captive issues, right? Because um, chimpanzees in captivity, the nature of our business is that we want to put ourselves out of business. So chimpanzee sanctuaries do, don't breed. Um, they, you know, we, we sort of have the advantage and disadvantage of looking 50 or 60 years out and being done. Um, you know, maybe that's wishful thinking, but um, we are working to protect those who are still here and saying no more. Um, we don't want them here because we can't meet their needs in captivity. Even the best possible sanctuary cannot do for them what the, what the range states um, provide. So it's sort of the other side of the, of the same argument. <laughs> Very interesting statement. So I think at this point we'll go to questions from the audience. I'm not quite sure. Doug will tell us how much time we have. We're going to sneak uh, over our limit. Um, but let's see. There's one right there. Yes, sir. My name is Ala Blom, uh, World Wildlife Fund. And I wanted to use this occasion to uh, a call to action um, from the people here. And maybe if we can reach further. Uh, Emma was uh, hinting to that. There is actually a groundswell at the moment to make wildlife crimes in the U.S. a serious crime. Uh, and you also mentioned, you know, we need to really improve the law here in the U.S. Um, and there is now an opportunity to do so, um, mainly because of elephants and the ivory trade, but great apes will largely benefit from that. Uh, the U.S. has just announced that it's going to destroy its ivory stock, but there is now also a groundswell to really um, improve the law, uh, both for the ivory, so that uh, the trade in ivory will become illegal in this country, but also to make wildlife crime a serious crime. Uh, and it is a serious crime. Um, wildlife internationally is now among the top five uh, crimes in the world illegal. It's about an eight to ten billion dollar a year crime. And the fines and the criminal prosecution here in the U.S. are a slap on the wrist at present. Um, if it becomes a serious crime, you can actually go to seizures of assets and things like that, and then the penalties become much more of a deterrent. At the moment, wildlife crime is a slap on the wrist. There's no deterrent and hardly any prosecution, and the U.S. needs to do better. So please go ahead, call your congressman, particularly if you're a Republican, uh, your senator, and uh, let's use this groundswell. There's an opportunity now. Within the, within the administration, there's a push. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before I turn it over, I just want to say the um, we're filming, actually, the Ivory Crush. Uh, it's a crush, not a burn, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife is doing. It's October 8th in Denver at the Arsenal National Wildlife Refuge. And if anybody is still in the region, come, because we're turning it a little bit into kind of a rally. Um, there's representatives from all the NGOs are coming, and there's a lot of press coming, and Fish and Wildlife are bringing a, quite a number of people. But, um, you know, October 4th is the Elephant March, and October 7th is the, uh, October 8th is the Ivory Crush. And, um, and elephants are just standing in front of a whole group of, of uh, species who need this kind of attention. So <clears throat> tweet about it and send your friends, and anybody who wants to come to Denver, come on down. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. You know, I think it's it, an interesting example of the wildlife crimes here in the U.S., um, sort of the system being flawed and needing improvement is sometimes when you catch someone doing some of this stuff, it creates a worse situation. Um, and when you were speaking, I thought of this guy in Texas who was trading an endangered species and doing all kinds of just horrible things, killing, you know, breeding and then killing them and selling them for 
um, for their fur or whatever, he got caught and one of the penalties was he lost his USDA license. So, um, you know, that sounds good, but then that level of oversight, whatever that did provide, is now gone. So he's now privately um, doing, you know, hopefully not the Endangered Species Act violations, but who knows what else, and, and it's harder to know what he's doing because there's no more oversight. Wow, yes. Yeah, um, I would just add, um, you know, absolutely there is a push right now. President Obama recently signed an executive order on wildlife trafficking issues, and there's a new task force, that, uh, an interagency task force that has been established. <clears throat> so we're very hopeful that that process will lead to um, increased prosecutions. There was a recent prosecution under what's called the Lacey Act, which is our oldest wildlife law in this country, um, where somebody who had legally imported um, an African elephant sport hunted trophy um, which is still legal in this country, which is a whole other issue, but um, had then illegally resold um, the tusks in interstate commerce, and that was prosecuted by the federal government, and we're hoping that we'll see more of those types of prosecutions, and certainly increasing the penalties will um, help a lot to deter those types of crimes. Very good point. Emma, I just have to ask, Christian Samper, your big boss, is one of the people on this new task force that was just announced a few weeks ago. Um, do you have the inside word on what's that task force going to do? What's the first step? <laughs> um, I do, but I don't think I can tell you. <laughs> oh, come on. It's a small group. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think uh, I'd just add to that that... Um, you know, I think this is an incredible opportunity where you've got this absolute focus like of a presidential task force to focus on uh, illegal wildlife trafficking uh, at, a, at a global scale. I think, you know, the, the challenge for this task force, um, I'm all for being ambitious and setting the bar high, but I think the challenge for this task force um, will be to try and just focus in to try and, and have the, the maximum amount of gain in, in the time available. Um, and I think that's, that's some of the discussions are, are, are revolving around that right now uh, as to, to where you can have the, you know, not, not the low-hanging fruit, but where you can really focus efforts and, and go for maximal gain. Um, but I think it's a fantastic opportunity. Um, I mean, it's like what you would dream of to have sort of, you know, a blank sheet to say what you would really like to do and how you would like to leverage um, sort of political dialogue um, and actual action for, for this kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Ben Janssen von Rainsburg from the CITES Secretariat. Now, um, as you already heard from others here, wildlife crime has historically been a low-risk, high-profit crime, and still is. Um, in many, many cases, sentences, like, like the previous speaker said, is just a slap on the wrist, and definitely not a deterrent. What is, however, very encouraging is, is like the, you've just heard, there is a lot of high-level political attention to wildlife crime at the moment which is very good because it, it brings a lot of attention to wildlife crime and it's a perfect opportunity now to push legislation to recognize it as a serious transnational organized crime. The one challenge you sit with is now that wildlife crime is increasingly being recognized as a serious crime, you still sit with enforcement authorities that historically dealt with, with rape and housebreakings and murders and that often do not realize the impacts and the importance and the seriousness of wildlife crime. So I think there's a, a lot of capacity building to be done. Our law enforcement authorities are not always aware of, of, of wildlife legislation. So there's a lot of awareness creation that needs to be done amongst the enforcement authorities to ensure that we have more prosecutions. We've heard that um, in, in many countries there's virtually no prosecutions in terms of wildlife crime. And that's because there's a lack of awareness of this legislation in, in these countries amongst enforcement authorities. Uh, you also said with things like, like the bushmeat rate, um, where again we heard that species-specific identification of bushmeat is, is a very big challenge. If I'm a police officer and I take a case to court, and in court I cannot prove my case and it's thrown out, I'm definitely not going to touch it again. So I think there's a lot of research needed in the field of bushmeat trade so that we can build capacity for our enforcement authorities to actually be able to take a case to court to prove what specimen is, is involved and to get a successful prosecution. I think that's vital. Um, you also may know that in, in, April, in, an, in April of this year, the um, Commission on, on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice of UNODC uh, adopted a resolution on crime prevention and criminal justice responses uh, to illicit trafficking in protected species of wild fauna and flora. 
And uh, this resolution, in fact, now recognizes wildlife crime as a serious crime. And this is, this is, is vital. This, what, what this resolution means is it mobilizes things like um, the UN Convention Against Organized Crime and the UN Convention Against Corruption. Now, what, that's, what does this mean? Um, if this resolution is implemented in member countries, then things like mutual legal assistance, extraditions, um, and minimum sentences come into play. Historically, wildlife crime was seen as a, a um, less serious crime. Extraditions, as we know, are only done for serious crimes. But with this resolution, if our member countries implement it effectively, you can be begin to apply all these tools to wildlife crime also. So this is very important. Interpol, for example, has a very effective notices system where they have red notices for, for internationally wanted criminals. Now, if you talk about transnational organized crime, you often have a range country, a transit country, and a destination country. And the key pin, kingpins behind crime often sit in the, in, the, in the destination country, way beyond the reach of the authorities in the range country. And that's why you need to apply tools like extradition to wildlife crime also. And this resolution now makes it possible. Um, May I interrupt you, please? That's so uh, interesting. There's a lot of information there, and I wonder if we could give the panelists uh, a chance to sure. respond. Is that okay? Emma, do you have anything to say to that? Sure, yeah. I mean, just the issue of um, you know, capacity building and, and awareness of enforce, different enforcement, enforcement authorities. I completely agree, p particularly those authorities that aren't focused on wildlife, so customs, for example. So and I was just thinking about, you know, we have a project in, in China, for example, um, that's working on, that's working with Chinese customs authorities, and it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, those those customs um, customs guards and custom authorities they see all sorts of things coming across the border from all across all across the globe, and they have no idea what it is. Like, I regularly get emails from our from our program in China with photographs. Of, of animal parts that they have absolutely no idea what it was. So just last week I got skins of Thompson gazelles that they had no idea what it was. And then we've had like horns of Ancoli cattle and things, I mean, just totally random things that come across. So uh, they've, developed, um, they've developed a really interesting app actually um, on just wildlife identification for customs guards in, uh, in China because they're just dealing with this ridiculous global influx of wildlife. So I think, um, particularly for those authorities that traditionally don't focus on wildlife, I think that's, that's a big deal. I mean, we're getting a little bit broad now, but um, I, think, I think it's an important point. Yeah. I have to ask, who in China is looking for Thompson's gazelles and why? <laughs> who knows, yeah. <laughs> like it's getting for decoration, but yeah. Broader and broader over there. Yes, Anna. Yeah, I think that the additional tools are also very helpful. I know that there has been some discussion domestically here of applying um, what we have as a tool, which is RICO, our uh, racketeering statute, applying that to wildlife crimes so that you have yet another tool for prosecution. Um, so I, I think that we're all in agreement that as many tools as we have in our belt, we should applying, be applying to these types of crimes. Sarah, do you want to speak to CITES now? Thank you for your <laughs> comment. Yes, sir, right there. Thinking about capacity building, I was wondering, um, thinking about U.S. and our parks, uh, it's benefited quite a lot, our laws, from environmental lawyers being involved. And I was wondering if there is a need or if there's cases where we have people from Europe or U.S. going to African range states and working with those people on the ground to really think outside of the box in terms of how to address some of these issues uh, in court and uh, you know, help build those cases that you, know, you have meat being trafficked within Africa and outside, I think. Sort of uh, a legal aid for international yeah. wildlife crimes? That's a very interesting idea. Sarah? I know there is sort of a fledgling program developing with exactly that idea um, at Lewis and Clark Law School, which is where I went to school, and it focuses on, um, uh, well, they have a program for animal and environmental law, um, and they are um, starting a sort of study abroad program um, where um, law students and law professors will go to Kenya um, and, and share their perspective from U.S. law on the um, issues, um, you know, that might be applied to situations in Kenya. So, and I'm sure there are other projects that, like that developing, too. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned, um, for sure, and 
Um, you know, then of course you just have to be sensitive to what works in the U.S. may not work in Kenya. But um, but definitely, um, I know at Lewis and Clark, and I'm sure other places. Um, uh, lawyers are starting to work on that. Yeah, one other example would be the Environmental Law Institute, which is in D.C., that does focus on capacity building. I think they've largely focused on environmental issues, your traditional clean air, clean water, et cetera, protection of land issues, but um, they might be getting involved in wildlife issues and certainly could be very helpful in that regard. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, yeah, providing legal assistance in developing a case uh, to, to take it to court and get a, get a successful prosecution is a big deal. Um, and you know, and I'm sure NAF can talk to this also, but in most places where we're working on these kinds of issues, like trying to get a, from an arrest, getting it to a successful prosecution, like local lawyers and jurists are integral to that, to that campaign. It's only, it's only integral to, to the, to the um, prosecution of the orangutan trader, for example. Um, I think having a local lawyer and jurist is important because they know the way around the intricacies of, of the local wildlife law and they're, they're highly variable a, across countries once you start getting into those details. But yeah, it's, an interest, it's a good idea, uh, it's an interesting idea to bring over additional legal support in, in that area. Yeah. Um, it's such a great idea and I'll just say this, that um, one of our colleagues, Paula Kahumbu, who was unable to come because of the events in Nairobi over the weekend, unfortunately, um, she was meant to be here, but she uh, managed after lot of lobbying, uh, her group Wildlife Direct got a new law passed in Kenya in June, which um, increases the, I think, jail terms and fines for poachers who are arrested um, and get through prosecution. And now her challenge is getting them through prosecution. And uh, there are just not enough lawyers who will work on this issue in, uh, in Nairobi with her. So we have... Um, you know, maybe we should start a Teach for America for, you know, young law graduates or something. If they're not enough law firms, maybe they'd like to do this. You think Lewis and Clark would do that? I think they would, and I'll just add um, that I think there there may be enough lawyers, um, but the funding, you know, to, to cover the lawsuits, lawsuits are incredibly expensive. They're obviously, uh, you know, in enforcement and that kind of stuff. They're the stuff that gets in the news, but it's also insanely expensive. So money is a key issue, of course, for, for all of our work. Right. Well, uh, we'll have to look at the Teach for America model. If there are any funders in the room, consider the legal approach. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm going to get over here next. I, I'm, I just wanted have to have a lighting one, issue. I just yes. wanted to add one thing to the whole the discussion about capacity building, in that uh, there's also, it's really, really important to build capacity, but then it's really important to tie that to results. And I think that's something that's been lacking in the past with capacity building in Africa. So basically, what I would hope for that in the future with like the kind of increased attention being given to wildlife traffic, that capacity building be oriented towards operations and towards results. Because even if people know their wildlife laws, wildlife laws also have huge ranges of possibilities. So in some countries, I, I just looked at the Ethiopian law a couple days ago and realized it's possible to get a $250 fine or it's possible to get five years in prison. So that's kind of a big range. and. Uh, I think that it's really important to, and that could be for anything. That could be for, you know, even an ivory trafficker coming through Ethiopia. So, or, and, I mean, that's just one country. The same applies to almost every country in Congo. It's the same. You can get a $200 fine or five, year, five years in prison. So, um, so it's really important that that capacity building be, be, be oriented towards the, towards the operational aspect as well, because that way we can make sure that we're also addressing the corruption issues as well. Um, wildlife traffic is a, is a conservation issue, but it's a huge rule of law issue as well. Are there any instances where you see the informal court systems being used to support these, these sound like very formal systems that the laws are being uh, used through, and is there any instances where the informal systems are used to support or tackle it from a different issue or idea? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm thinking a few, a few months ago I was in South Sudan and, um, you know, they're just obviously getting to grips with being a new nation and everything's very basic and, you know, wildlife laws and enforcement of them is, is, is an emerging subject there. Um, and we were out in one of the protected areas and it's extremely remote and we were working with some of the rangers there. And um, I was talking to the, to the ranger leader and I was sort of saying, you know, what do you do if, if you find someone um, with a load of bushmeat? Um, and he said, oh, yeah, we, we, we deal with that with, the, with the, the, the committee in the village. You know, they're put in front of that committee and that guy is, is and, you know, ostracized and um, it's, it's very effective. 
And I said, oh yeah, so you don't bother going through the, the you know, the, the federal or legal systems? And he was like, you know, what, what federal or legal systems, you know? And, and it was, seemed, seemed to work very well. So I think there are examples of where that, that can happen, um, be sort of context specific. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, and in the U.S. as well, I mean, often for sanctuaries, all you have to do is ask for them or make space for them, and you can get them. You don't have to sue or, you know, file, you know, create a new law. You just have to have space, and that's really the issue for U.S. sanctuaries is, you know, they'll fill up as much space as they have available. A couple of points of information from your earlier discussion, if I may, and then a question for Emma. Um, there's been quite a lot of talk about elephants and ivory, and I just wanted to point out that that is an important issue for ape conservation, because where forests that have apes and elephants lose the elephants, the quality of the forest re is reduced for apes. It's a less good place for apes. apes elephants are very important for ape conservation. Um, the, the discussion on which countries go the extra mile for uh, ape protection uh, legally, I, I would point to Uganda and Rwanda, where uh, apes are so important for the economy of the country through the tourism, and in Rwanda in particular, because in the language, Kenya Rwanda, uh, the word for gorilla does not fall within the same category as the word for wildlife. Wildlife is Inyamaswa, and then there's people, and then there's Ngagi. So they have a, a, a respect for gorillas as something other than just wild animals. Um, you were discussing international law, and you, you're right, although GRASP is the only UN body that is specifically focusing on a group of species, um, the Kinshasa Declaration that GRASP uh, uh, negotiated with all the range states and the donor countries uh, that, that ties to a global strategy that all the nearly all the countries with great apes have signed up to, it's not a legally binding document. Uh, but there is a legally binding treaty for apes, and that's under the Convention on Migratory Species. There's the, the Gorilla Agreement, where all ten countries that have gorillas agree to a treaty that they would ensure that the gorillas survive, and, and there's an action plan attached to it, and they are legally bound to do that, although not all ten have yet ratified it. So there are some instances of international law that affects apes. But the question for Emma is a new project that's just started uh, that I've been involved with developing with the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO. Um, in four Central African countries, uh, with Jeff funding, there is this new bushmeat initiative, which is to work with communities in, in two pilot projects in each country where at the moment it's, it's legal for people to hunt bush meat of non-protected species, but not to sell it. And there's no law enforcement, so of course it is sold, and so is the, the bush meat of protected species. And the aim of this project is to work with the hunters, with the communities, and give them a, the, the legal right to sell bush meat of non-protected, rapidly reproducing species in return for their agreement not to kill the protected species, and better law enforcement. And I wondered if, Emma, if you've heard anything about this, whether you have any strong views on it, uh, because I know it is a contentious issue. Any kind of loosening of the law on bushmeat makes people very worried. But if you're saying, yes, you can sell cane rats and, and blue diker, but not protected species like apes and elephants, maybe it's worth exploring. And it is happening, so we've got to live with it. But what do you think about it, Emma? Yeah, no, I'm aware of that. Um, I'm skeptical. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, for all the reasons that I'm sure, you, you know, you, <laughs> you can think of and that, you know, there's loopholes there for, for how enforceable it, that project will be, um, particularly as it's working, you know, just from a Gabon perspective, it's working with ministries and enforcement agencies that are weak. Um, so, and I know the idea is to, to, to help build all of that. So, um, let's say I'm, I'm skeptical uh, and there are a number of caveats to it and it hasn't been received particularly well. Um, from conservation organizations to date. Um, and yes, like you say, it's going ahead. Um, but we'll see, how, we'll see how that gets on. But yeah, it's interesting. We'll see. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, right here. Hi, Katie Conley with the Humane Society of the United States. Thanks to everybody on the panel for all your uh, wisdom. Um, I just want, for me as a campaigner, very focused on ending the use of chimpanzees and research, I think the legal work we've done, when you look back historically, is kind of an interesting case where we passed legislation back in 2000 that created a national sanctuary system. 
for chimpanzees. It was up to the researchers to retire them. There was a provision that allowed chimps to be pulled back out of the sanctuaries and back, put back in the labs. We decided to continue to move forward and support that, and seven years later came back and amended the law that got rid of that loophole so they can't pull chimpanzees out, and then came forward with a bill that would actually say everyone is going to be retired and you can't use them anymore. So I think just building over time and building the relationships Sarah brought up, a senator getting involved, if he hadn't heard from people all those years about chimpanzee, you know, it's like there, it's almost when something comes up, the relationships are there and you can go into action. So I think just having, even if legislation doesn't pass, having it out there, I don't know if that's true internationally, but I know here just having something in the queue builds relationships and helps with moving things forward. Well, I think that's true. And it also gives us an opportunity as uh, media people to start reporting on it, to try to generate some buzz around it, build some momentum uh, around it. There's, um, <clears throat> that's an opportunity for us to toss, I think, toward the film festival that starts later today. And if there's filmmakers in the room, you know, we need more, better, louder, you know, getting, uh, getting the word out about all these issues. I just want to add one thing, which is that um, this new report is out. Uh, there's several copies that are back there on the chair. It's about the uh, trade, the illegal trade in um, primates. Carl Amon and his crew have put this together. Take a look. It's, uh, it's in a pile right there. Um, I want to thank our panelists, you guys, Emma, Anna, Sarah. It's amazing the work you do. Thank you so much for coming and bringing your perspectives with us. <laughs>